Good morning, everyone. Um, I think we will wait one, two minutes before we start. So I can see everyone dropping in. Thank you. So good morning for you who are already inside. We are waiting one or two minutes just to to um, have everyone online before we start. So feel free to get comfortable. So good morning, everyone. We are right about to start. Um, maybe just before I get going, um, you all see me, I think, and, and the slides. And uh, there is also um, a button where it's a question mark that you can write questions throughout the webinar and we will treat them by the end. Um, I think that's the main. We will also record this webinar so um, since you who are attending are not showing your videos you will not show up on the on the screen uh, but uh, so you know that the, the session is recorded also very good so I think I will get going we are five minutes past so it's time to to get moving hi everyone good morning good morning Bienvenido. Bon dia. Um, my name is Jennifer Ekström. I'm the chairwoman of the Swedish Portuguese Chamber of Commerce. I'm very glad to have you all here today um, to our new webinar where we will treat uh, aspects of moving to Portugal. So uh, maybe many of you are in the thoughts or already have taken a first step, but we are um, moving to another country. It's a big decision. So today we will treat the uh, any type of different aspects of what you might need to think about, how is it to live in Portugal, um, legal aspects and financial ones. So we really hope you will enjoy this webinar. Myself, um, I'm chairwoman of the Swedish Portuguese Chamber of Commerce. We are um, ClickBiz. So we are, um, normally we say that uh, on one hand, we are the gateway to business and trade between Sweden and Portugal. This means that we facilitate um, business. We facilitate business entries and connection between different business to create um, or empower the ecosystems on both, both our markets. We open doors. We are here to support um, mainly Swedish companies uh, who are already present in Portugal or maybe looking to come to Portugal, but also Portuguese companies who have business with Swedish ones or want to expand to Sweden. 
another strong pillar of us is that we call ourselves a networking hub. The networking hub is um, kind of the core of our community. We want to be here. For example, today we gather all of you to spread. It can be different topics that we want to reach out on, but we want to connect Portuguese and Swedish professionals on uh, leading topics from both countries where we see that the synergies can, can flow. So, um, you see the slides, and this is just a couple of numbers to show what makes us proud. We were founded in 1982 by the main Swedish large organizations that were present in Portugal by that time. Uh, today, we have more or less 115 members as part of our community. And the majority are um, corporate members, but we also have a quite a growing individual community. So many of you today might be part of both be interested in being part of this or wants to stay updated to other activities that we have during the year. We cover, with all our members, we cover uh, 21 sectors. So there is a big broad knowledge within the community as well. Most members are, as mentioned before, but either Swedish companies or Portuguese companies. We have a couple of other companies um, or individuals who are not Swedish or Portuguese, but then they have a very strong connection to the Swedish Portuguese. Uh, business or um, networking society. If you look at Sweden in Portugal, so there are a bit more than 110. Um, uh, please go back <laughs> one slide. With more than 110 uh, Swedish subsidiaries, and here we're counting only the subsidiaries who are direct, so to say, if there is um, a subsidiary of a um, fully owned by the Swedish company. Um, so Portugal is counted, even if small market, as a mature market. Main Swedish companies are present, they have sales office, there are even some that have production here. So the, it's, it's a vast um, mix of Swedish industry in Portugal. And it's another curiosity, um, the Chamber of Commerce. So we are a non-profit profit organization. We're built on Portuguese bylaws. Uh, I am um, the chairwoman, and then with me, I have 12 other people in our board of directors who uh, steer, so to say, and set the direction for the organization. And then we have uh, one uh, full time uh, manager, our secretary general, which um, is new at the moment. So it's Roya Moghadas. I don't know if you will be able to see her, but um, she's here as well. And I'm very glad to have her on board. And um, please, uh, next slide. So anything you would like to contact afterwards, you can contact with Roya or with me. About the Swedes in Portugal, since this is more focused on the individual part of, of our networking hub. So um, the latest figures we have is that the, in 2019, there were almost um, well, a bit more than 180,000 Swedish tourists coming to Portugal. And if you look at uh, the spending in tourism is quite high, it's 223.5 million euros that they spend and 7,225 nights. So um, we are, even if not the biggest tourist uh, partner to Portugal, we still have a good share of spending. And uh, as many of you might be aware, Algarve is uh, being the most popular destination for Swedes, followed by both uh, Lisbon metropolitan area and Madeira. So how many Swedes live in Portugal? This is a number that we don't really have real facts on. It's an estimate number that says we are around 5,000 because when you move to Portugal, on one hand, you can register yourself as a Swede on Svenskalistan, as you call it, by the embassy for any emergencies that you, you are registered as a Swede in Portugal. Not everyone does that. And from the Portuguese uh, authorities, you cannot either count Swedes registered in Portugal living here. And we know also part of you, or maybe not you, but your other Swedes, they don't live here uh, all year. So um, the estimate is that we are more or less 5,000 Swedes in Portugal living continuously. And um, just to summarize this, please click. As I mentioned, um, with me here today is Roya Moghadas, and she's uh, all yours. So any question you might have, uh, feel free to contact or me or her and we will treat it um, when we can. We are co-located with the embassy in Lisbon, so it's close to the Assembleia, if anyone has been there. Otherwise, it's part of the Estrela Lapa area in, in the center, uh, very in the heart of Lisbon. Um, but uh, feel free to um, 
enjoy this this webinar and we hope you have a good time today so going to our um next speaker i would like to introduce um Umbria. and by Umbria, uh, from Umbria, we have our um, Joan Ric uh, Richard Costa, who is Director of Sales and Marketing at Umbria. So uh, we're very happy to have you here, Joan. And, Good morning, uh, everyone. Feel free. The screen is yours. Thank you so much. So uh, Jennifer, thank you. Um, we are proud members of the Swedish Portuguese Chamber of Commerce. And, uh, and thank you very much for hosting this webinar this morning. So my name is uh, João Richard Costa. I am ha I head up the team, the sales and marketing team at Umbria Resort in located in Portugal. Um, next slide, please. So um, when uh, when Swedish clients and non-Swedish clients come to see us, um, they you know they most of them have already chosen Portugal. Um, to, to live in or to spend their holidays in or to invest in real estate in. Um, most of the reasons that people come to us uh, and come to Portugal in general is, is because they see Portugal uh, as having you know, good infrastructure, being a welcoming country, uh, having a relatively low cost of living and also for the, the safety aspect. There are many other reasons, obviously, but these are some of the main ones. Uh, that people mention when they come to us. Um, on the next slide, um, I want to talk about why they come to the Algarve. Obviously, Lisbon, Porto and, and some other cities in Portugal are, are, are very well known. Algarve is the most, the biggest and most important tourism region of Portugal. Uh, it's a very well established tourism and real estate market. It is seen as generally as, as an upmarket destination. Its climate is wonderful all year round. There are lots of golf courses here and people come, you know, for the uh, for this kind of lifestyle um, and also obviously because of the beaches. Um, Faro International Airport has lots of um, connections uh, to Europe and to other countries and uh, it's well served last year it had something like 9 million passengers in you know in the whole year in 2019 and um, and people value that you know that easy connection uh, that the algarve has uh, next slide please um, so how has the pandemic um, changed um, you know the, this perspective of the algarve and portugal in general for several several things have changed and in terms of the real estate or second home market um, we have noticed that people are valuing more and more um, this connection to nature the sustainability aspects and also they're looking to invest or to live in places that have uh, low density construction uh, where they have easy access to to green spaces and to outdoor spaces um, and the, the, the second and most important one is uh, if they want to work from here, you know, for, it's very important that their house, their new home uh, has some kind of workspace that they can, uh, you know, get away from the main house and obviously high speed internet there. So um, in general, uh, people are looking to have a more balanced uh, work family life basically and and the Algarve and Portugal in general has been you know one of the best places uh, that people have identified recently as as uh, to be to be investing in and to to live from um, next slide so I'm going to talk about a little bit about Umbria Resort and 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 how uh, Umbria Resort is, is you know, a, a place, uh, one of the ideal places to live in the Algarve. Let's go ahead. Um, so what is Umbria Resort? It, it's basically a, a new generation, low density, sustainable development, um, where we are building currently uh, a five star hotel uh, that started construction in uh, late 2019 and will be ready by 2022. Uh, the 18-hole golf course on the site is already completed. It was built uh, over 2018 and 19. 
And we have several other leisure facilities in, in the resort, such as uh, astronomic observatory, beekeeping facilities to produce our own honey. Uh, we have several hiking and, and biking trails, and obviously all that surrounded by uh, beautiful nature, but with 24 hour security. Uh, we are located in Algarve, uh, in the center of Algarve, in what we call the authentic heart of the Algarve. So not far from the city of Lole uh, and about 20 kilometers uh, inland from north of Faru Airport. Uh, the closest uh, beaches are beaches uh, around Quinta do Lago and Val do Lobo and Vila Moura, uh, and those are about 20 minutes uh, from us from the coast. Um, I've already spoken about Faro Airport and how it has so many uh, different connections. These are just some images of what the Algarve looks like. You may have seen some of these images before. The interior of the Algarve is somewhat different from uh, what people are used to seeing in, in uh, tourist postcards, let's say. Uh, the inland Algarve is a little bit different, very green, very hilly as well and, and uh, has life all year round. Uh, Lole City specifically is, is an all year round city. Uh, there are about only 20,000 uh, inhabitants in the city of Lole and its surroundings. And um, it's lively, it has a market uh, uh, every day that people come to, to buy their you know, local goods, produce, you know, fruits and vegetables and so on. And generally, um, generally speaking, people are very welcoming and, you know, uh, lots of uh, different nationalities live in and around Lole. Um, so this is the location, eight kilometers north of Lole city center. And as I said before, about 20 kilometers from, from the nearest beaches and from Faro Airport. Uh, these are just images of the um, the local surroundings. Uh, the image on the bottom right is one image of our golf course. Next slide, please. And sustainability is uh, part of our DNA. This is our most important value. We do this by having um, implemented already some renewable energies, such as geothermal energies and solar panels. So this will be a benefit for uh, owners because um, they will have lower cost of, um, of electricity, for example, lower cost of running the properties. And, and for us, it's very important that the resort is well integrated into the local landscape and also well integrated with the local communities that already exist around us. So we want to be for them to feel welcome into the resort and we also want the owners that will buy properties with us to feel um, welcome to explore the local surroundings and interact with the already existing community. Um, who owns Ombrio Resort? Well, it's, it's a Finnish company actually called Pontos Group. Uh, that is a private family owned uh, investment company. Um, they have an annual turnover of over 700 um, million euros and they employ in their portfolio companies over 6,000 employees. Um, they are uh, based in Helsinki and we're, you know, we're very proud to be part of their, um, of this group and their network. So the master plan of Umbrio Resort, as I said, mentioned before is 153 hectares in total. It has uh, an 18 hole golf course that you see there in the green parts. Uh, there is also a, a very big part of the land, which is about one third of the 150 hectares that is simply um, green area. So this, you know, this part on the, on the south, uh, on the south side. And then the parts in orange are the, um, the real estate and hotel development areas. Uh, these will be the, this will be developed in phases. The first phase is the area uh, in the center of the image uh, which is being built now. And that includes the Viceroy Hotel and Residences and the Alcedo Villas, which I will explain in the next few slides. Let's go ahead, please. So this is a 3D image 
uh, a computer generated image, sorry, of the of the surrounding area. Uh, this is a, a real photo with some computer generated images of the, the buildings. The buildings are still not completed. They are being built at the moment. Um, and you see the golf course there with a stream, a river running through it. Um, there is, you know, a natural stream there and uh, the lake that is there is already done. That's something that we built over the past two years and it's our water reserve for uh, watering the golf course. Let's go ahead. So what's in the resort in total? It's there's a five star Viceroy Hotel, the 18 hole golf course, a restaurant, fitness center, stars observatory. There's an organic farm, a conference center. There will also be a beach club on the coast with a shuttle service, regular buses to go to the um, to the beach. And also, as I mentioned before, some walking and bicycle trails. Um, the hotel, the five star hotel is um, designed and built as a village, as you see in this image. Um, once it's finished, uh, our objective is that it looks like a village that's have always been there. Uh, this hotel will have 76, 76 guest rooms and suites, 65 apartments, which are the viceroy residences that we sell as, as uh, branded residences, apartments, uh, five restaurants, spa, library, swimming pools and so on. And all of this is going to be, um, next slide please. And next one, yeah. All of this is going to be um, managed by Viceroy Hotels and Resorts, which is an American uh, hotel management company that is headquartered in California. They have 20 years of history. They operate around 14 hotels currently, and um, they are a modern and um, intuitive uh, hotel management company. Uh, these are just some images of what the, the hotel will look like. This is the, the some of the restaurants in the hotel. Next slide. The library in the hotel. Next one, please. The swimming pool, the interior swimming pool in the spa. Next. And now I'll talk about the Viceroy residences, which are the 61, the 65 one and two bedroom apartments. So we sell these sold uh, fully furnished and equipped. Uh, the construction, as I mentioned before, started in December 2018, along with the construction of the hotel. So it's the Viceroy Residences apartments are part of the hotel. And currently we've sold about 25% of these units. Next slide. And um, we sell them with a minimum guaranteed net yield of 5% per year for the first five years. Uh, the owners can use up to 10 weeks per year without any costs whatsoever. And um, so the 42 remaining weeks of the year, the apartments are being rented out by Viceroy to guests who obviously pay to stay there. And this rental income goes to the uh, owners of the, of the apartments. Next slide. So these are some images of the views from the apartments towards the golf course on the south side. And then the Alcedo Villas, which are only 12 turnkey new built uh, residential villas that have either uh, three, four, five, six bedrooms or seven even. Uh, they're being built in plots uh, that vary between 1,700 and 3,300 square meters. So very large plots with uh, construction areas that vary between about 480 and 750 square meters. And uh, they have separate guests, uh, pavilions or workspace pavilions in there. And next slide, please. And um, they have personalizable interiors. So um, the outside exterior design is uh, is done by Promontorio, uh, some architects based in Lisbon, uh, but then the interior can be personalized by each owner. Um, once we sell one of these villas, we take about 12 to 14 months construction starting from the purchase, the signature of the purchase contract and the owners have no restrictions whatsoever on the use. They can use them all year round. They can leave them empty or they can rent them out. If they rent them out, they can do it themselves or they can come through us um, and we'll uh, rent it for them. 
And next slide. So the, this is uh, an image of some of the views towards the golf course from one of the balconies. And uh, we don't need to see this video now, but um, I will invite you to uh, go to our YouTube channel uh, or go to our umbria.com website and see um, some more images and videos of the um, of Umbria Resort. Those are my contact details. Thank you very much, and we look forward to um, to welcoming you at Umbria. Thank you very much, uh, Joao. Glad to You're hear welcome. all this about um, about Umbria and, and the fantastic project you're building. Thank you. So, um, up next we will have uh, Danske Bank. Our next speaker is uh, Sunny Barua. He is international banker of uh, Danske Bank uh, in Luxembourg. So, um, with this, I would like to warmly welcome Sunil. The, the screen is yours. Thank you, Jennifer. Tack så mycket, Jennifer. Jag switchar över till svenska här, eftersom det är mitt modersmål och det, presentationen från Danske Bank är på svenska. Bilderna, eh, next slide please, eh, är på engelska, men vi talar svenska. Jättekul att så många är intresserade av att lyssna på det här webbinariet. Eh, Sunil Barua heter jag som sagt och eh, rådgivare och kundansvarig för de svenska kunderna på Danske Bank i Luxemburg. Faktiskt varit bankman i 20 år i år och de senaste fem åren här i Luxemburg. Fyra faktiskt mitt femårsjubileum här nästa vecka. Jag har innan jag började på, på kontoret i Luxemburg aldrig hade varit nere i Portugal. Men sedan 2016 har jag rest kontinuerligt och vi är också medlemmar av kammaren i Portugal. Med mig idag har jag två flera kollegor som ingår i det team som vi bygger upp våra kunder. Idag har jag Patrik Sorich och Emilia Vejola med mig. Patrik är ansvarig för nykundsrekrytering och den personen som våra potentiella kunder först kommunicerar med. Det är han som presenterar Danske Bank mer utförligt och berättar om vad vi kan erbjuda och tar reda på vilka förväntningar kunden har på oss som bank. Efter Patrik så kommer Emilia att säga några ord och hon är vår skattejurist som är tillgänglig för alla våra kunder när det gäller frågor och funderingar som kan uppstå när man till exempel flyttar från Sverige till Portugal. Men hon bistår även med hjälp vid behov under tiden man bor utomlands. Hon har lång erfarenhet av internationell skatterådgivning och hon har ett stort nätverk som är tillgängligt för våra kunder. Dessutom har hon flera trevliga kollegor i Sverige som hon kan ta hjälp av vid behov när det gäller de svenska skattefrågorna. Många av våra kunder har som mål eller en dröm att flytta ut från Sverige, till exempel vid pensionering. Det finns många frågor och funderingar som dyker upp. Och vid de tillfällena är vi som internationell bank väldigt bra att ha att göra med och vara behjälpliga med de frågor och funderingar som dyker upp. Next slide, please. Danske Bank International, som vi heter här i Luxemburg, är specialiserat inom internationell private banking. Och vi har funnits här i Luxemburg i över 40 år. Vår primära arbetsuppgift är att rådgöra förmögna nordiska privatpersoner som bor utanför Norden. Vi är ungefär 85 personer som jobbar tillsammans och vi täcker områden som förmögenhetsrådgivning, finansierings, finansieringsrådgivning och internationell skatterådgivning. Vi är som sagt en nordisk bank och självklart erbjuder vi service på de alla nordiska språken. Next slide, please. Luxemburg eh, räknas ju som ett av de högst rankade finansiella nav i Europa för internationell business. AAA-rating och stabil geopolitisk miljö det är viktiga faktorer som jag tycker man bör poängtera. Det har skett en hel del förändringar i marknaden eh, som öppnat upp möjligheter för oss här på Danske Bank att ytterligare växa inom branschen. Vi ser att de nordiska bankerna minskar i antal. Och vi har ett klart mål i banken att vi ska bli den banken med de mest nöjda kunderna i branschen. Vår ambition är att bli den mest föredragna banken i Luxemburg. Jag avslutar där för att lämna över ordet till min kollega Patrik. Patrik, varsågod. 
Tack Sunil. Patrik Sarich heter jag som sagt. Jag jobbar primärt med nykundsrekryteringen i, i banken och specifikt vad gäller svenska kunder. Vi är idag sju dedikerade svenskar som arbetar i det svenska teamet med olika delar. Vad som är viktigt att tänka på är att vi, vi har valt en strategi i banken när vi jobbar med team. Så vi har ett, team, ett fullt team runt varje kund som bidrar med de delar som de är experter på. Sunil är en sådan, Emilia är en sådan, jag är på ett sätt sådant också. Och sedan har vi också hjälp på finansieringssidan och även vad gäller investeringar och assistenter såklart. Så sju stycken totalt dedikerade bankers som arbetar runt varje kund. Typiskt sett så, så är det jag ofta som träffar kunden och definierar egentligen på vilket sätt vi som bank kan hjälpa till. Och varje kund är väldigt unik och har olika behov av en bank. Och därigenom så är det också viktigt att på något vis definiera och se på vilket sätt vi kan allokera olika resurser i banken för att hjälpa dig som specifikt dig som kund. Då. Och vi har ni som då nu bor i Sverige och lämnar den svenska marknaden kanske är ju vana vid en viss plattform också vad gäller bankingtjänster och vi har naturligtvis en nordisk plattform vad gäller e-banking där du kan då göra dina överföringar som vanligt. Du kan också ta hjälp av en assistent. Du kan också göra egna affärer via vår, vår plattform, köpa aktier och göra andra investeringar och fonder. Och även vad gäller kreditsidan. Så typiskt sett så vi har alltså sju stycken dedikerade svenska som jobbar med våra svenska kunder. Och på alla de olika sätt som, som behövs. Nästa sida, tack. Next page, please. Yeah. Så det här är lite det som, som den möjlighet som finns. Vi, vi är en private banking enhet inom Danske Bankgruppen. Vi har flera olika möjligheter vad gäller investeringar. Det kan det svara att du har, gör dina, fattar dina egna beslut, gör exekvering, köper fonder, aktier och annat direkt via vår plattform. Det kan också vara att du har hjälp av en person som är specialist och vi har ett helt team idag med investeringsspecialister som jobbar enbart med investeringar dag ut och dag in. De är ungefär åtta stycken, varav en är då dedikerad för oss som arbetar med våra kunder. Och vi har dessutom en möjlighet att kunna göra diskussionära lösningar, dels, dels via inom ramen för exempelvis då en försäkringslösning eller, eller på, något annat, på något annat sätt. Det finns en rad olika möjligheter beroende på vad du som kund vill. Vad som är viktigt är att vi anpassar alla investeringar utifrån den riskprofil och den placeringshorisont som varje unik kund har. Och det är ett av de... Det är en, det är, ett av det, det är det arbete som också Sunil gör tillsammans med vår investeringsspecialist. Så att alla investeringar blir anpassade till vad du själv önskar. Och risk är idag något som, som banker generellt sett arbetar väldigt, väldigt mycket med. Och självklart också din placeringshorisont när du lämnar Sverige. Next, next slide, please. Ni som... Ni som svenska kunder har ju naturligtvis redan ni har ett fotfäste i, i Sverige. Eh, vad som är viktigt vad, vad, vad gäller den aspekten som jag också nämner är att eh, det, det kan vara en stor fördel att vara en stor kund i en liten bank som, Lux, som, är, som finns i Luxemburg. Vi kan, ta, vi kan anpassa våra erbjudanden naturligtvis till, till de delar som finns i Sverige vad gäller finansiering. Vi kan hjälpa till med bolån i olika delar av Europa men vi kan också arbeta mot vår hemorganisation om det är så att ni som utflyttade svenska vill ha ett sommarboende eller något annat. Så på det viset så har vi en möjlighet att kunna hjälpa till med så många olika delar eh, vad gäller era, era, ert boende. Eh, vi, kan också, eh, vi kan också hjälpa till med att göra, in, göra krediter på en, en investeringsportfölj exempelvis för att om möjligt köpa någonting i Portugal eller någonting annat i några andra delar, någon annan del av Europa också. Men, och det, till det har vi då naturligtvis också en kreditspecialist som arbetar tillsammans med mig och med, med Sunil. Eh, vad gäller hela den, hela den aspekten av er bankaffär då. Eh, jag överlåter nu med varm hand till Emilia. 
Tack Patrik. Att, äh, att hantera förmögenhet, beskattning och familjerättsliga frågor i gränsöverskrivande situationer så är, är ofta väldigt komplicerat och kräver en viss sakkunskap. Vi har ett specialistteam i, med internationella skattejurister i Luxemburg som hjälper ungefär 1500 familjer som är bosatta i över 80 olika länder med att se till att beskattning och förmögenhetsplanering sker i enlighet med tillämpliga regler. Vi har ett tätt samarbete med våra kollegor på, på hemmamarknaderna och så erbjuder vi även våra kunder tillgång till ett brett, nätverk, äh, brett professionellt nätverk i olika länder för att se till att allt köts i enlighet med tillämpliga äh, regler. Och, de får, och, och se till att våra kunder får det råd som de behöver för att äh, behandla sina problemställningar. Och vårt mål är att se till att äh, våra kunder kan njuta av livet just nu och vara medvetna om att skulle någonting oförutsett ske så um, för förmögenheten över till följande generation enligt plan. Next slide please. Um, kapitalförsäkring är ett väldigt väl, en välkänd investeringsform i Sverige men också i övriga, övriga Europa och uh, även, även utanför. Och man kan säga att en internationell kapitalförsäkring så kan tillpassas vid en flytt mellan olika länder um, och medför även en, en fördelaktig beskattning i de flesta länder eller i, i många länder. Och man kan säga att i Portugal så erbjuder försäkringen en uppskjuten skatt. Det vill säga att det blir ingen löpande årlig beskattning utan istället så beskattas vinsten då, då man gör ett utdrag från försäkringen. Och dessutom så får man en, en lägre skattesats efter att försäkringen varit i kraft en viss tid. Så efter åtta år så betalar man endast ungefär 11 procent skatt på vinstandelen i ett utdrag. Och kapitalet tar man ut skattefritt. Vi samarbetar med, med ett antal um, kapitalförsäkringsbolag i Luxemburg som erbjuder internationella lösningar. Både för kunder som bor i Sverige och uh, för kunder som bor, bor i övriga Europa. Och vi kan, gärna, vi kan gärna ta en diskussion om, om, om det är intressant för er att fortsätta. Tack. Tack från Danske Bank. Vi återkommer i Q&A lite senare. I'll repeat this in English. We'll take the questions afterwards. And of course we will answer question in English when it's needed. Thank you from us. Thank for us. Thank you very much, both uh, Sunil, uh, Patrick, and Emilia, for um, for this very interesting presentation from Danske Bank. Hope you've en enjoyed this um, this moment to to get to know more of this uh, tailor-made services that they offer. So, um, from Danske Bank, we go now to um, look more at the legal aspects. So, to today we also have with us another partner of ours, uh, which is Servul. Um, a very high level law firm uh, based in Lisbon and uh, our final speaker for today's presentation is Teresa Pala Svalbas. Uh, she's tax partner at several law firm in Portugal and um, Teresa warm welcome and the screen is yours. Well thank you Jennifer um, everyone be very welcome and thank you for attending our webinar it's a pleasure to have you here as Jennifer mentioned, I am a partner and head of the Scandinavian desk at Servul Law Firm. We are a full service law firm operating in Portugal over the past 20 years and working for both companies and individuals. And over the significant part of our last years, we have actually um, created the Scandinavian desk, which is a specialized platform assisting uh, companies and individuals who may have an interest in Portugal, either investing, moving or running a business uh, and uh, of course that a lot's been said and if you're here today it's because you think of different reasons why Portugal may be an interesting country uh, for you to move to. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the different uh, reasons why you may wish to, to move to Portugal. I'm sure that there are a lot of them and you've thought about uh, a lot of them. Namely, um, 
of course, everyone knows about the sun, the good food, um, so many other different reasons. I would like, however, to um, mention at least one of them, which I think is a bit surprising, uh, because considering these exceptional times we're living in, we could consider that people um, would perhaps not want to move because it's a difficult time. Uh, we have a pandemic, unfortunately. Uh, we may all feel more comfortable staying in our home countries where we know how the health system works, um, where are familiar with the language, we're perfectly at home. But curiously enough, because of the way that Portugal has been handling the pandemic, um, we've been seeing that this has been actually another reason why a lot of people have uh, wanting to move to Portugal. We have even been commended uh, by the New York Times by the way that we've handled it during the initial moments, which I'm sure that it's with Sweden because you're in Portugal. We have also discussed quite significantly um, how Sweden has also treated uh, this situation. Uh, and because it's so important, I wanted to let everyone know that uh, Por Portugal's health system, according to a study made by the World Health Organization, actually ranks 12th in the world um, when it comes to um, the quality of the services. In the same ranking, for instance, Sweden is ranked 23rd. So it's interesting that our service is so well placed um, our public system has actually been able to almost single-handedly handle the pandemic. Our government was prepared to enter into arrangements with the private health sector because we have a large number of private hospitals and it hasn't been even required. So we've been handling out through the public system, which is an interesting uh, uh, way on how this has been handled by us. Of course, that... that um, I cannot say that everything is great, when you, you come to Portugal, we do have our issues. One of them is the bureaucracy, to, to be quite honest. We have some public services which work extremely well, such as the tax authorities, which is a surprise for people coming from Sweden, from other countries such as the United Kingdom, that uh, our tax authorities are actually quite uh, um, active and, um, and quite efficient in the way that they handle. But on the other hand, of course, we have other public entities which um, are extremely hard to deal with, such as the social security and are quite bureaucratic and uh, have a lot of red tape. So if you're considering moving, uh, it's important to be aware of these aspects to manage expectations. And of course, another important aspect is the language. Um, while um, for some, this may be an interesting challenge to learn a new language, uh, Portuguese is not easy to learn. Um, what I hear from most Swedes is that it's easy to catch in writing. It's a bit hard to understand when we're speaking, and if it's it's even harder to um, to try to to learn it. Um, but this being said, the Portuguese are all very friendly people who try to uh, help, and most of us speak in English as well. And if you're considering moving or investing, um, the effect or we should expect that the pandemic could have caused some type of effect on our real estate market, namely. Uh, and I'm sure that here, João from Umbria is more qualified than I am to speak, but according to the statistics that we have and what we've seen in terms of market trends, actually the market seems to be stable. Uh, prices may even slightly increase, uh, which is not necessarily a problem because the price of houses in Portugal when compared to our GDP is actually one of the lowest in Europe. This being said, and uh, João has already said a lot about this, um, there are a lot of reasons why investing in real estate in Portugal may be an interesting investment. Um, there are different locations, as Jennifer also mentioned. Um, the Algarve is definitely the most popular region where Swedes move to. But I would say that ultimately, if you're considering living in Portugal, there are different regions in every area, be it the Algarve, Lisbon or Oporto, they're all quite different and depend on what each person is looking for. Um, if you're looking to play golf, if you're looking for something more cultural, if you're looking to relax and have a less busy life. So we have, uh, I would say, areas to cover um, everyone and everyone's interest. Uh, the Algarve is particularly interesting, not only because of the weather, which is relatively stable throughout the year, but also because it's a popular holiday destination. So when it comes to investing, 
um, in a project such as Umbria, you know that yields can be um, can be interesting because it's definitely a popular holiday destination, and so um, definitely there will be a lot of people coming to to stay. Uh, but I just wanted to give you a bit of a background, um, and now going a bit more into particular, I wanted to fill you in on a couple of differences of how things are done in Sweden and how things may happen in Portugal, so you can be prepared for what to expect. Uh, we've had already a number of questions on the Q&A and we would be happy to answer them all. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to answer them all right now, but we will mo be more than happy to uh, answer them after the webinar if we're not able to address them all right now because they're quite different among them and our time is limited. Um, but this being said, one subject which I would like to highlight, which is also is always important, and because we're speaking about real estate, are the differences of what it happens and how does the process work in Portugal to buy a property when compared to Sweden. And the process is quite different. Uh, in Portugal, we have three main stages. This is not mandatory to follow all these stages. It's not a legal procedure, but I would say that 90% of the real estate transactions that have an, happen in Portugal are done this way. So basically what would happen is that if you identify a property you like, any type of property, you make a bid, and if the bid is accepted, then we start the, the purchase process. At a first stage, uh, usually um, the process runs through a broker, and the broker will ask the potential buyer to sign something we call a reservation agreement. The intention of this agreement is to basically show that the buyer has a serious intention to buy so that the seller is comfortable. Usually there's a small deposit being paid, which is left with the broker. This is a very simple agreement. And within two to three weeks of signing this agreement, then uh, the parts, uh, the party signed something we call the promissory sale and purchase agreement. Now, this is not yet completion, so you're not actually buying the property when you sign this contract. This is a preliminary contract, which is a big, a big one because it basically defines all the terms of the transaction and the terms on which the final deed will take place. So you can define everything if you're, for instance, buying a house with Umbria and you would want to, if that's possible, make changes to the property, then you would define those terms and the changes that you want on the promissory agreement. Usually as well in this promissory agreement, you would be asked to pay a deposit. Usually it's around 10% of the price. And unlike what happens in Sweden, it's important to realize that in Portugal, deposits as a rule are paid directly to the seller. And so they don't stay with the broker. Of course, that again, this is not mandatory. This may be subject to discussion and agreement between the parties, but how this usually works is that the seller expects to have at least 10% of the deposit with him uh, before completion um, has a safe sign um, that the deal is going through. And then, of course, I would be happy uh, to, to discuss what happens if the deal doesn't go through or what could happen to these 10%, but this is the rule of how it usually works. And upon signing the promissory sale and purchase agreement, we have the final contract. The timing between both moments can depend quite a lot and on a lot of factors, such as if you're buying something which is not yet built, of course, we can only sign the final contract after the construction is made and we have all the legal paperwork in place. If you're buying something that's already built, then if the seller lives in the house, they may need to move out. If you need a loan, to buy the property, then it may also depend on the timing that the bank requires to prepare the loan and the mortgage that's underlying to, to the loan. Um, but usually it wouldn't be unusual to have at least two months difference between two contracts. So we can say that in average, the process to buy a house in Portugal from the moment you have a bid that's accepted until the moment you actually own the property, it could be at least three to four months. And one very significant aspect is that the purchase costs in Portugal can be quite high. Uh, our estimate is that these costs can be around 10% of the final price. And why? Because when you buy, uh, at the moment of the final deed, there are four costs to be considered. We have two different taxes. They're already on the purchase. 
a stamp duty and a property transfer tax. There are notary fees and there's a registration fee so that the property can be transferred to your name from a legal perspective, but namely the costs, the, the taxes represent the significant cost uh, on this moment. Now, of course, there's a lot that we can say on these aspects, but this is usually how it works. It's a three stage process. You may or not follow all of these stages, uh, being that the the decisive moment is the final deed, and that's the one we cannot live without. This would be the rule. Um, I would highlight, however, that Umbria, for instance, um, would have some specificities. The process is relatively the same, as you can see on our slide, but from a legal standpoint, Umbria is what we call a tourism development. That means that, as João has explained, if you buy a property with Umbria, you can choose to live in it or you can choose to rent it out. And under our law, there are a number of specific conditions that apply to this type of tourism developments. Namely, when you buy the property, and I'm quite sure that I can speak of this from a legal perspective, but if you're interested, Ombre could even explain it far better than me. Um, if you're interested in buying uh, and you want to rent it out, for instance, when you buy, you will have to sign a contract with an entity that Ombre will designate that will actually make the exploration of the tourism um, on the on the project. So you cannot freely just decide to rent it out, go on booking and advertise it yourself. You have to run by a specific entity that is designated by the project's developer. Uh, and this is not um, just some condition that we create. This comes from the law itself. Uh, uh, but naturally, these are all aspects and contract which um, will be taken care of uh, and fully discussed uh, if you decide to buy. Um, we find it important, according to, to our experience on these matters, to highlight these main changes because some of them are usually a surprise when Swedes come to Portugal and a lot of questions raises in terms of the process to buy a house. Um, questions such as what happens to my 10% deposit if the deal doesn't go through? Um, what happens if I want to back out? What happens if the seller backs out? So there are a lot of questions we could discuss. We will happily take them on the Q&A or if you have any questions at the end of our presentation, you will also have my contact details and you're free to send me an email and I will gladly answer any questions you may have. Um, I would say nonetheless that um, investing in real estate in Portugal is not the only aspect we should consider. If you want to move, there are a number of practical aspects to consider uh, and to implement uh, and a different number of registrations to be made. Uh, for instance, if you were to move and you wanted to deregister with the Swedish tax authorities uh, to, from Sweden, you would speak with, uh, with Skatteverket, with the Swedish tax authorities, and that would be it. In Portugal, however, um, our public entities, and there you go, the bureaucracy, they don't um, work very well between them. They don't exchange information. So what happens is that if you move, you will have to speak with at least four or five different public entities to register with each one and inform each one that you've moved. Of course, the main registration would be with the tax authorities. Uh, upon moving to Portugal, you become a tax resident in Portugal, and that implies that you're liable to tax on your worldwide income. So it's irrelevant if you just have Swedish income. Every year as a Portuguese tax resident, you still need to file a tax return, report to the Portuguese tax authorities you have that income, and then they will come back and tell you whether any tax is payable, depending on whether you're a regular tax resident or if you have any type of special status, such as the non-habitual residence regime. And if, of course, that because you're a Swede moving to Portugal with Swedish income, the double taxation treaty between both countries also comes into play. Right now, um, and we know that this is a question that concerns a lot of Swedes, but the fact is so far the new treaty is not in force. Portugal has not yet approved these changes and we cannot provide an estimate as to when that will happen. So the old treaty is still in force, the one that says that Sweden can only claim tax on uh, state pensions, if we can provide that example, which is of course the main issue under discussion. Um, so uh, currently the rules still apply and Sweden cannot claim tax on private pensions. This will change of course when Portugal does approve the new treaty, which we don't know when it's going to happen. 
Uh, but if you're living in Portugal and you're an actual, if you're a tax resident, just like all of us Portuguese, um, then you could be subject to progressive tax rates, which can be quite high and are not that different from Sweden because they can go up to 53%. Um, so only if you have uh, any special type of regime, such as the non-habitual residence regime, you would be able to have some type of benefit in this regard. Apart from the tax authorities, and there are other registrations that need to be done. So moving to Portugal is a very bureaucratic and time consuming moment from the perspective of the, the registrations you need to do. There are registrations with the social security, there are registrations with our public health care system. There are a number of other type of registrations for such as apparently minor issues such as the driving license, which of course you can continue to use, uh, but you still need to register with the authorities in Portugal to let them know that you're here, for instance. Other questions that also arise, and especially on these types of pandemics, are the um, issues about the European health card, the, the, the blue card that is issued and allows you to travel through Europe and use public systems. There are a lot of questions about, is it still issued by Sweden? Does it start to be issued by Portugal? So, and especially today, in the times that we live, this is also important to consider. Um, but once this first step is done, I can assure you that the first year is uh, burdensome, but from there on, on an, uh, an annual perspective, if you want, the, uh, the compliance burden would just be to file an annual tax return. Otherwise, the administrative obligations are significantly reduced. And of course, one very important aspect as well is that Portugal has a very good environment if you want to have a business. There are areas where we are particularly good, such as IT. We have many companies like uh, Google, uh, Ericsson, Mercedes-Benz who are coming to Portugal to establish digital hubs because of the expertise that they are finding with uh, local Portuguese. And our system is otherwise quite friendly as well if you want to start a business. We have different types of companies you can incorporate. We have a system similar to uh, what in Sweden is usually referred to as personal companies. So basically each person working has a freelancer in its own name. You may choose to otherwise incorporate a company. Of course, different regimes and rules will apply to each of these options. And this is a subject with a lot of details, which uh, unfortunately we're not, we cannot go into detail today. Um, but overall, um, I would say that we will all be very happy to welcome you in Portugal. According to a very recent statistics that we had access to, um, Portugal is seen, uh, perceived as the third best country for an expect to live in. And uh, as uh, I, I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, uh, there are a lot of reasons why you may wish to move and I'm quite sure we have a reason that's adaptable for most of you. Um, I know that we have, as I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of questions in the Q&A. We would be happy to take a couple of them following the end of our presentation during the Q&A. If we're not able to, you have my contact details and I welcome you all to please send me an email and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. In the meanwhile, I would very much like to thank you for your time and your presence here today. And I pass on to Jennifer. Thank you very much. Teresa, um, glad to see you all here today and, and this very interesting moment, Teresa, explaining both the some of the lifestyle aspects, but also legal uh, aspects of moving to Portugal, both in a bureaucratic and practical way. So um, we would like to move on to the questions and answers. We have uh, got many questions, so I'm asking now both Omria Danske Bank and Servolu to publish the ones um, that we will start with and um, as Teresa said if we don't get time to uh, to answer to everything we will follow up after the, the webinar um, with the questions that were unanswered. So um, asking Umbria first um, taking it in the same order we, we uh, held the, the presentations. 
Mm-hmm. Yes, so um, we had a, a couple of questions there. I'll be, I'll try to be as yep. fast as possible. Uh, one of the questions was about tennis and paddle. <laughs> paddle has been uh, <laughs> um, a, a, a sports that has grown uh, in uh, popularity here in Portugal, the same as Spain. Uh, and there's, there are a lot of paddle courts uh, nowadays in, in the Algarve. Um, open air and covered ones, mostly co- open air because of the weather, obviously. Uh, at Umbria, we will have tennis and paddle, uh, but in the second phase. So we will we have plans to build a sports center, um, which will include tennis, paddle, uh, football, rugby, and, and several other sports. Um, but it will only come online after 2022-23. So we are currently uh, have filed um, or we're filing for um, um, authorizations to get the sports center uh, authorized and then and then built. So it will come online at the latest stage. Uh, there was a question also about uh, which uh, beach is Umbria Beach Club going to be at. Uh, I cannot reveal yet which one exactly, but I can I can tell you that it's going to be in the area of Villa Mora. So the beach club will be uh, uh, existing as from 2022 when the hotel opens and it will be somewhere near uh, Villa Mora, which is about 20 minutes drive from from Umbria. Then there was a question on the cost breakdown of buying an apartment uh, at Umbria. Um, I think uh, Teresa touched upon, you know, a little bit this this uh, theme. Uh, essentially, um, when you buy an apartment at Umbria, you pay the price for that apartment. Uh, currently, we're still selling off plan because the apartments are being built. So um, buyers pay the price of the apartment uh, partly, um, uh, well, in parts uh, uh, along the construction time of the apartment. So usually we ask for a certain percentage of the apartment price to be paid on signature of the promissory um, sale and purchase agreement, as uh, Teresa mentioned. And then uh, usually we have uh, three uh, stages um, of payment throughout the construction. And the final stage of payment is done on signature of deed. And that's when uh, the taxes need to be paid. Um, So um, Teresa mentioned uh, a maximum of 10%. Uh, of the price uh, that needs to be paid in taxes. The, the, the breakdown is essentially um, what Teresa already mentioned. There's a property transfer tax. There is, um, there is also stamp duty and there are some legal costs and um, also notary costs. So part of the, part of the costs are, are legal and notary and part of it is tax basically. Um, with uh, at Umbria, the properties have different uh, come into different tax brackets. So, for example, the viceroy residence apartments pay a, a 6.5% property transfer tax, and the villas, uh, because they are over 1 million euros, they pay a 7.5% uh, property transfer tax. So, different taxes sometimes apply to different types of properties. Thank you very much, Joao. You're welcome. I hope also that our audience got the response they they were looking for. Um, So uh, let me pass to Sunil, um, or Sunil, uh, Patrick and Emilia. Yeah, I Uh, could take. If you would like to answer to some of the questions that you've received. Thank you. Yes, I can take the questions regarding why we spoke in Swedish. Uh, Today's session was Swedes moving out to Portugal, and we felt like Swedish is our uh, mother tongue, and that's what we, how we communicate with our clients. But of course, as I mentioned, we are a Nordic bank. We have services in all our languages, Nordic languages. And I would suggest that persons uh, with another Nordic language contact uh, Patrick uh, with the contact details that we have uh, in the presentation, and he will uh, help you out to direct you to the right person to uh, to discuss uh, and answer your questions. I think Emilia can had a question to answer as well. Yes, absolutely. And I think uh, Teresa already touched upon this, but it's of course uh, a hot topic uh, as to 
when will the new uh, tax uh, treaty be be approved and and what happens if not so um I guess the rumors currently are that okay it's, it's not yet approved but it might be approved in connection with the budget for 2021 uh, in December perhaps and if not there's definitely a risk that Sweden may just uh, terminate the treaty uh, if nothing happens and originally they wanted the treaty to be uh, approved already in I think 30th of June so uh, yeah let's see what happens but no confirmation so far and not, nothing nothing concrete on that side. Then there was a question about uh, what happens if parents in Sweden die and there's an inheritance, what would be the consequences in, in Portugal? I think Teresa can confirm this. So you're not, I think Teresa is trying to say something, but my understanding is that there should not be any tax consequences in, in Portugal uh, between uh, direct uh, heirs. Thank you very much, know. Emilia. Yes. Yes. No, I, think this I don't know if Teresa can, uh, can confirm it maybe as, as the local expert. Yeah, I think we will also pass on to Teresa. Um, looking at the, the benefits and the taxes, I would also say, uh, even if this uh, treaty does not come through, there are still many benefits moving to Portugal uh, on oh, other okay. aspects. So um, yeah. I think that's also good to have in mind, um, even if there will be a couple of different in the percentages. So uh, please, Teresa. Um, well, you know, I have to start by, if you allow me to make a small joke, because there are a number of <laughs> questions here that has a lawyer, my answer could be, it depends. <laughs> Not because I don't want to answer, but uh, as you know, in, in any first, uh, and in any civilized country, as you know, rules, tax rules specifically are becoming more and more complex. There are a number of exceptions. Um, the tax authorities, I think, are becoming less sensible to many aspects. I know that, for instance, there were a lot of Swedes stranded, so to speak, in Sweden because of COVID. And I think that the Swedish tax authorities are not going to be sensible to that fact when it comes to ruling that they are tax residents in Sweden during 2020, for instance. So there are many questions that I got here that I'll try to answer to as far as I can. Uh, leaving this disclaimer that they are very specific and that there are a number of exceptions. So again, I would be very happy to discuss the particulars of each individual situation if you want to drop me an email or have a quick conversation. Uh, replying to what Emilia was saying, yes, has a rule. Portugal doesn't have an inheritance tax or a gift tax. We do, however, have a tax that certain services apply uh, to these type of transactions, but Usually what happens if, is that if you're a Swede living in Portugal and your parents die in Sweden and all the assets are located outside Portugal, as a rule, there is no tax. On the other hand, if you're a Swede living in Portugal and you have your children and you're wondering what happens if you pass away, then as a rule, there is also no tax when the inheritance goes to your direct heirs. Uh, so Emilia is quite of an expert when it comes to, to tax rules in Portugal. <laughs> Uh, I would invite you to, um, I know that some people will like to find a place where they have comprehensive information on all of the rules applicable in Portugal. That unfortunately may be a bit difficult to, to find. What I would, would suggest is that um, you try to find reliable sources of information. The Swedish, uh, the, the Chamber's website has uh, a small part, for instance, on doing business in Portugal, which you can run through. Servo has its own information. You may be able to find information on the Portuguese government's website. So uh, you won't be able to find, I would say, a, a website or some source of information which compiles everything you want to know on tax and property and inheritance and so far. It's quite different, quite difficult to, to get it, but you may be able to find at least some sources of reliable information in that regard. And again, because these are very specific rules, um, but trying to answer a couple of more of questions that I got because there are so many, then I apologize in advance if I miss anyone in the, in the midst. Our rules are quite open, so if you move to Portugal, answering to one of our questions, you can get your pension and you can freely work in Portugal or outside Portugal through a personal company, through a company registered in Portugal or abroad, so that's perfectly okay. The only aspects to look out for, of course, would be that the company is legally incorporated or that all the legal rules are being a bit by and that, of course, 
you are familiar with the taxation applicable um, to those situations. Um, we have no uh, information also in this regard. The Portuguese tax authorities have not, and I think this is important, been active um, chasing, so to speak, foreigners who move to Portugal, especially to benefit from the NHR regime. So um, our experience has, has been that things have been running quite smoothly. So there is no case law uh, on a number of situations and how, how they have been handled by the tax authorities or the courts, such as on, one co on what concerns insurances. But there is some practical experience on how this been how this has been dealt with in specific situations of individuals that had their own situations and conversations with the tax authority. And I would be happy to take that on uh, personally uh, on other aspects. Um, very specific as well are, of course, the tax treatment for UN pensions. Um, uh, because this comes from the UN, so they have a specific tax regime uh, as the person who raised the question most likely knows. Again, this is a bit specific, and so on behalf of the rest of our attendees, I would be very happy to take this uh, personally as well. And I think there's one important question as well that may also connect to Umbria, and so if Juan wants to jump in afterwards, he's happy to, um, which is an aspect which we didn't cover because we discussed how to buy a property, we didn't discuss how to sell it. So the sale process of a property in Portugal is relatively easy. If you want to sell, you can just start advertising by yourself or you can contact the broker to sell it off. Uh, from a tax perspective, if you live in Portugal and you decide to sell the house you live in because you're moving back to Sweden, you decide to move to a different property in Portugal, you want to move to Spain, something else, uh, usually, if you make a profit on that sale, so if you sell it for more than what you bought it for, personal income tax in Portugal applies at the general rates that I referred to during my presentation, which may go up to 53%. Nonetheless, because if we're discussing the house you lived in, then usually there is a tax exemption that applies on that sale. There are a number of specific conditions that have to be met in order for that tax exemption to actually be applicable, uh, but uh, as a rule, it's possible to actually mitigate quite a lot the tax burden on this type of sale of properties. Um, I'm quickly just running through the questions. Um, I think we've most more likely managed to cover them all. So, Jennifer, I would pass on back to you. Thank you very much, Teresa. I would actually like, um, since also we see that the um, um, there is one more, I think, to Danske Bank here also. Maybe I should uh, pass back to Sunil shortly before we make a, a recap. So what is the average loan to value percentage for your home loans? I don't know if it's something you want to answer here or if it's something you want to take later. Yes, uh, I, 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 I might uh, answer that question then. Uh, we, uh, for the time being, we don't do pure mortgage loans uh, in Portugal. We have clients buying property in Portugal. Uh, what they uh, normally do is that they use their investment portfolio and we help them with the portfolio loan. Uh, and I can see and we can see uh, several advantages with this. We can structure in different ways. Uh, you can still invest in, uh, in the market and the interest rate is very competitive and we don't require, require any amortization of a loan like this. And we actually see this as a good advantage for our clients to use this opportunity more than using a more a pure mortgage loan. Back to you. Um, if I may, Jennifer, can I? Yes, feel free. Thank um, you very much. Can uh, I Patrick, say something yes, about that? Are. Okay, thanks. Um, just to say that um, uh, typically at Umbria, when someone buys a property, it is possible to buy it. Uh, with the mortgage. Uh, we work with, with several banks. Uh, I mean, we recommend several banks to our uh, to our buyers. Hopefully, we'll be able to also recommend Danske Bank in the future, uh, if possible. Um, but typically, the loan-to-value amount that uh, buyers ask or that banks offer is around 70% of the sale price, of the, yeah, of the price of the property. 
thank you very much for this uh, input, Joel. Um, yeah. I think as um, we have covered most of the questions um, that are published, um, I would actually like just before my final words, maybe if I could ask both Ombria, Danske Bank and Servalu to give or uh, one word or a phrase on your input why um, why Portugal or, or why would you recommend anyone to move here or why you find it um, a good move for for from your each or one of your aspects let's say shall I start uh, Feel free to start, as I yeah. mentioned uh, before 2015 I've never been to Portugal and then I started with my first travel to Portugal in 2016 and um, with uh, I can only say I'm uh, kind of getting fun of Portugal almost kind of getting in love with Portugal so Portugal is my market uh, from the Swedish aspect and I travel co uh, continuously to Portugal once twice a year now and uh, I kept my other colleagues away from it so <laughs> that would be my answer glad to hear do you want to um, add something to this, Joel? Um, I would just like, time? sure, I would just like to say that, um, you know, moving to Portugal is sometimes a, um, a complex and daunting experience, and sometimes it can be uh, very straightforward. Um, it's all about the attitude, obviously. If you want to move to Portugal, then I would encourage you to look at all the options, um, come and experience it for yourself for at least a few days before you do the move. And um, with regards to Umbria Resort, I will say what our motto is, which is carved by nature. Thank you. So finally, Teresa, what would be your um, suggestion to, to anyone wanting to move to this uh, beautiful country? So it's so hard to say because um, We've all named a number of reasons why it may be interesting, but I would have to second Joao and say, come um, speak with friends that live here, experience different parts of the country. And I'm quite sure that everyone finds something they can get in love in Portugal, be it the weather, the food, the wine, uh, any specific location. So uh, we just welcome you to come. Uh, and uh, once you're here, we're quite comfortable that you will find something to fall in love with. Thank you to all of you. I can actually myself add a, a small input to that one. I had a very interesting conversation yesterday um, with a person and we discussed, another Swedish person, and we discussed why we like Portugal so much. And um, one of them was a bit about the mindset. So what we see in Portuguese culture, at least, that is more not being a uh, Swede in Portugal, but being uh, living in Portugal in contact with the Portuguese is that Portuguese in, in general, so this is very generally, I'm not saying it's for everyone, neither that it's not happens to Swedes, but um, they know how to enjoy life in a different aspect. Um, and if you want to talk about it more later, we can also discuss it further. Uh, but obviously, um, time is running fast and we're almost uh, at the end of this webinar. So I would like to take also the um, opportunity to make a bit of a recap of this uh, hour and a half almost that we've been here. Uh, first of all, I'm we're, both me and Royo and, and from all of the CLS organization, we're very happy to have both uh, Ombria Danske Bank and Servalu with us today. Um, and to and also all of you in the audience um, listening, we hope you've had a fruitful uh, hour and you've learned a lot to get a lot of new ideas spurred into you to or visit, continue visiting or maybe um, coming here on a more uh, homey level in the future. So um, what we see and it has been discussed is that uh, Portugal as a destination, um, most of you know it, has become increasingly popular uh, during the last years, uh, nominated both as world-class destination, one of the most safe countries in the world, um, even having one of the, was it top 12 healthcare in the world in, in several aspects. So um, both Swede, uh, and other nationalities have considered and made Portugal uh, to their new home or preferred destination. Um, and looking to the presentations that were given to us, I would just like to uh, highlight a couple of things from all of them. So uh, Ombria, this fantastic uh, 
project coming up. It's uh, some kind of a new generation, uh, low density, sustainable development, uh, close to Lule, so in the favorite region for, for most Swedes. Um, includes boat, golf, hiking, paddle, tennis will come, uh, and a lot of other uh, nature experiences, as well as the beach club we spoke about. I think it was interesting to hear that they will use renewable energies, both geothermal and solar panels, to uh, to empower both the the, um, the hosts and also the the property buyers. And uh, knowing that you have 153 hectares of sustainable living close to nature, with uh, any type of commodities you might wish for, um, or in a five-star hotel or your own residence, I just think uh, it's a, it's a lovely way of seeing uh, this project coming up. From Danske Bank, um, we have had them as partners for, for many years now, uh, the Chamber, and I know they're good at breathing life into dreams. So um, both their specialization in the private banking and having been that since uh, the 70s, I think it's good to know also that they um, have a highly developed platform for e-banking and offer one point of contact for the customers, uh, even as they have uh, I think you said seven dedicated people to each customer, so it's a very personalized and very tailor-made service. I would say um, also there was advantages for being a good or a larger customer to this uh, smaller bank uh, that they have in, in Luxembourg. So, uh, and I think also you mentioned something very interesting in, in your presentation, Danske Bank, that uh, the focus is that the customer can enjoy the life uh, in the moment we are now and still feel secure when you're treating the uh, wealth management for, for future generations. And I think that's also something what, what I mentioned Portugal is for. It's uh, knowing or having the mindset of enjoying the life we're living and not stressing too much and also being able to enjoy the small parts of everyday life and, and good quality life aspects. From Servalu, um, also one of our partners for, for many years, I think they have a, a fantastic Scandinavian desk would say, um, and it's also good to see when uh, Theresa shared the insights on why people moved to Portugal. Uh, once upon a time, I was also one of them. Um, didn't know much about Portugal, but I came here anyhow and, and got in love with the, with the country. Um, and also the, um, the input she mentioned about um, Portugal handling the pandemic, which has been very highlighted in, in various magazines uh, globally. And um, somehow knowing there's a lot of benefits, both uh, privately or sun or, or beaches or, or any um, that you might want to have here. There are also some challenging aspects of Portugal. So the bureaucracy is, uh, takes time. There's a lot to think about, but I would say um, having entered here myself, um, if you read everything and if you do what they say, you should do and if you complete all the steps it goes smoothly it's just that many times there are a lot of steps but uh, there is no so to say trespassing through them um i also think there's an interesting the difference on buying a property in portugal comparing to sweden there are differences on the pre-agreement the deposit uh, pinch seller and also the costs the poor costs that um different taxes and and uh, for the purchase that Teresa was speaking about. It's good to consider when you're looking at it and also uh, connected with Umbria, the, the special legal frameworks and conditions when buying property with tourist agreements. So um, in, um, well, besides this also from the private living, um, as was somehow mentioned during the webinar, Portugal has many benefits for starting a business here. So if you're still active and want to, to uh, generate your business from Portugal, uh, it is a good uh, place to be, uh, but also a good place to be uh, an expert in. So, um, having had the pleasure of uh, hosting you all today, I can only say thank you. Um, obrigada. Tak. Uh, it's been great to be here and I hope you've had a good time as well. I think Roy has mentioned here in the, in the Q&A, the presentations will be available afterwards. We will also uh, finish the recording of this webinar so you can see it again and um, feel free to contact any one of us uh, to continue your journey, uh, maybe moving to Portugal. 
Thank you very much, everyone. Have a very nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bon dia. Bon dia. Tak, hej, hej. Tak, hej.